people. Uh, you are certainly our honored guest, and we ask if you are visiting with us to take out one of those cards that you see in front of you and fill that out, and you can put that. There are a few boxes in the, in the back that you could put that in. That's just so we can express our appreciation for you being here this morning. To all the youth group, please know if you start nodding off, I'm going to call you out by name. <laughs> They had a lock-in uh, Friday night, stayed up all night, looked like they had a, a great time. Uh, I was thinking about going, but I probably wouldn't make it through the sermon this morning if I did. Uh, so thanks to Jeremy and Jake, uh, all of our youth deacons for, and, and all of our volunteers and chaperones for everything that they do uh, for our youth group. Uh, as we think about the things that bring us peace and tranquility, in our lives, nothing makes us feel more at ease, more comfortable, more confident than knowing that that which is most pre precious to us is secure, is safe, and free from harm. And, and, and oftentimes, we, in our lives, we go to great lengths to ensure ourselves of this feeling of security. We build grand buildings. We have security systems. We have all different manners of, um, of, of things that, 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 we, that we do, that we build to make ourselves feel secure. One of those examples is uh, Fort Knox, as I'm sure most of us have heard of before. Fort Knox holds, it, it holds a large portion of the United States gold reserves. It's protected by 20-ton blast-proof security doors that require these passcodes that, that are unique to each member of the staff. If it's heavily guarded um, and it's closed off to the public at, at all times. Uh, another example is the Cheyenne Mountain Complex, which acted as the center for the United States Space Command during the Cold War. It would monitor uh, the North American airspace for uh, uh, potential Soviet Soviet missiles um, that would be incoming. It's built into the side of a mountain. Uh, if you get on Google and type in the Cheyenne Mountain Complex, it's, it, it's a sight to behold. Um, it's capable of withstanding and remaining operational in the event of a 30 megaton nuclear blast and is protected by a series of 25 steel blasts doors. So we do all kinds of things to make ourselves feel safe, to make ourselves feel secure. And this desire that we have naturally to feel safe and secure, it, it's not an evil desire. It's not wrong. It's not wrong at all to pursue security that gives us peace. However, like everything else that we've been talking about in this series, our feelings of security can so easily be converted into an idol and placed on the throne of our hearts as a supreme thing, as an ultimate thing that's more powerful and trustworthy in our eyes than the Almighty God. The idol of security is what we're going to talk about this morning. It's something that holds us back from touching the full potential that God created us to reach. But what we are going to dive into, what the Bible says about this idea, when our need for security is fulfilled from the proper source, we will have the courage and all the fortitude that we need to live with a here I am sinned me attitude every single day. When our feelings of security are proper sourced, then we will be able to say, here I am, send me. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. First of all, let's make this note. Security is a human need. It's not just something that we desire, a, a, maybe a commodity that we could do without. It is a need that we have as human beings to feel safe, to feel secure. We cannot properly function uh, when we are overcome with feelings of insecurity. I think of soldiers on the battlefield. If their morale is low and they feel insecure due to their circumstances or due to a lack of leadership, 
They're not going to fight as well as they would if they felt secure in their commanders. If they felt secure in their circumstances, they would be much better equipped. Likewise, if you don't feel safe in your own home, if you think uh, that you are going to be burglarized um, at some point, you won't be able to carry out your daily routine like like normal, uh, but you're going to be constantly looking over your shoulder and wondering if your suspicions, uh, what you think may happen, are correct. We need to feel secure. We need to feel safe. We need to feel at peace. We need to feel confident so that we can carry out our God-given abilities. Now, it should be no surprise to us as, as students of the Bible and people who know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it should be no surprise to us when we behold the character of Jesus, when we have his attributes, what he is like in view, it should be no surprise to us that he desires wholeheartedly for us to have our need of security fulfilled every waking moment of our lives. God desires that you feel safe. God desires that you feel secure. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 through 20. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 through 20. The Hebrew writer says this in verse 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly, focus on that phrase there, to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that's set before us. Verse 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, how beautiful the promises are that are embedded within this passage. God desires, notice what this passage says and implies, God desires to show us more convincingly, more convincingly. He wants us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that his saving work on our behalf is unshakable. God wants me to enjoy security, safety, and peace through the work of his son for me. This Security in Jesus, it's like an anchor, the text says. Something that's solid, something that's sure, something that cannot be moved, that is impenetrable from an outside force. My relationship with Jesus is intended, the Bible says, to flood my soul with feelings of peace, of confidence, of assurance that my soul is safe from any kind of evil, from any kind of outside force that could potentially snatch my security away. And there are many different religions today and even brands of Christianity that say something like this. Yes, God saves people, but no, you cannot be assured of that salvation. You cannot be sure that your works are good enough to appease him, that your faith is strong enough to satisfy him. Brothers and sisters, this is an extremely deadly idea and it's false to its core. God works and words ring loud and clear to us that he desires that we feel secure and safe in his arms. 1 John 5 13 reveals the purpose of the entire writing. 1 John 5 13, I write these things, John says to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. 
God doesn't desire that you walk through life saying, I hope I've done enough. God doesn't desire that you walk through life saying, I hope God will let me into heaven because I have obeyed enough of his laws. Rather, his desire is for you to remain fixated on the grace of his cherished son, which gives us, the Bible says, continued motivation to live joyfully in a state of self-sacrifice to our Lord Jesus Christ, feeling all the while secure in all of his promises and all of his guarantees that he makes to us. However... At the same time, even though God desires our security and offers us a flood of peace into our souls, our hearts still wander at times. We know this. We so often take our God-given need of security and fulfill it through secondary counterfeit sources other than Him. When we do this, we convert a good thing security and safety and peace into an idol, which is exactly what the Israelites did in the wilderness. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 14, verse 1 through 4, and let's notice together how the Israelites converted feelings of safety and security, which they need, into an idol, into something ugly that was intended to be something beautiful. Numbers chapter 14 verse 1 through 4. Now of course this passage in the context it uh, is after the spies that go into the promised land. They see the incredibly powerful nations and they're overcome with fear and dread and they stir up the people and they say we can't do this. There's no possible way that we can conquer these people and this is what happens in Numbers 14 1 through 4. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we have died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in the wilderness. Why is this Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. The Israelites, they wanted to go back to Egypt, to what was comfortable, to what was familiar, because they dethroned their security and confidence in God where it was supposed to be and replaced it with other sources. They replaced it with their own strength, with their own willpower, and it resulted in disaster. Sometimes I think we, we, we see examples such as this in the Bible. We see examples such as the Israelites. And, and, and sometimes I think we think, what foolish people. What foolish people that would see the power of God right in front of them. Front of them. Like th- this is a group of people that just witnessed plagues, fire raining down from heaven, the firstborn of all the land of Egypt dying The Nile turned to blood. Like they witnessed all of this incredible power of God. The power of God was right in front of them. Sometimes we think, why didn't they believe in the security that God provided? Their actions, their actions are not just unique to them, but rather they are intended to illustrate the human condition as a whole. So don't think... Don't think for one minute that you wouldn't be any less tempted than they were to doubt God's security. Because through this story and others like it, God is saying this is the human condition. This is the human heart. That is the power of the idol of security and idolatry in in general. It pulls us to mistrust the power and character and the love of God even after we have personally experienced it in our lives. And it causes us to settle. 
It causes us to settle with what's familiar, with what's comfortable, with what I know, all the while forfeiting the pleasures and the promises that God brings to us. The idol of security causes us, in essence, to go back to Egypt, to a place of false security like the Israelites did. So we know that security, it becomes an idol when we fulfill our need of it through a different source other than God. And we do this in all different kinds of ways today. We do this in, in many different, there's many different manifestations of the idol of security. We convert security into an idol when material assets, kind of like what we talked about three weeks ago, when material assets give us a greater peace than the peace that's found in Jesus. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. I would argue that everyone in this room is rich in comparison to the vast majority of people that have lived in the history of the world. And, and, and notice what Paul says in this text in 1 Timothy 6. He says, your riches, everything that we have, our material assets, um, all that we possess, he says that it is uncertain. It lies in uncertainty. They're not trustworthy as sometimes we place our trust in them. They seem like things that are lasting. They seem like things that will be uh, long-term, that will last eternally, and things that will bring true peace. But that peace that materialism brings, it's all an illusion. It's just an, a, a deception to make us feel temporarily at ease. Uh, the security from what's in our 401k, the material assets we have, and the amount in our bank account is, is so often elevated above the security found in Jesus. And we ourselves are guilty of placing security on the throne of our heart in the place of the security that God brings when we elevate our material assets and our possessions to a level above the security that God brings brings to us. A security can also be manifested uh, in our lives when relationships become our source of superior comfort, when the relationship with your husband, with the relationship with your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or, 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 or whatever is a source of greater comfort and security and peace and the peace found in Jesus, so oftentimes we do that. Another manifestation of the idol of security is when our confidence rests in, in our own abilities, in our talents, and what God has graciously given to us. Another manifestation is when our fear of rejection, uh, in which I would say all of us have to one uh, degree or another hinders us from actively sharing our faith. I think that's fair to say. Another manifestation is when our self, when our sense of self worth comes from our physical appearance, it originates within us. Uh, there's so many people that try to find ultimate security and peace within themselves by, by looking inwardly, by looking at their physical appearance, by how their body looks in comparison to others, but the irony of it is that, is that it, never, it never ultimately works. When I try to find, when I try to find a, a foundation for my self-worth in the way that I look, because bodies age, bodies decay, we grow old and beauty fades. The Bible says, rather, if our self-esteem or our sense of self-worth originates not in how I see myself, but how God truly sees me and how God treats me, then I will never, never have a problem with feeling unworthy. <coughs> Excuse me. Just, just think about it. A being such as God, high and lifted up, holy, holy, 
holy is, is he? Is willing to go through what he did in Jesus Christ for me, for somebody like me? Then if that's true, and I believe with all of my heart it is, then I, you, must be unimaginably, unimaginably valuable and worthy in the sight of a holy, holy, holy God. You can experience confidence and security about who you are, but it will never be fully realized by looking inwardly, only by fixing your gaze upon Jesus and what he's done for you and all that he is to you and all that he remains to you will you be able to burst with self-confidence and self-worth. The idol of security, it manifests itself in so many different ways, but the truth, the truth behind it all is that we are never really secure when we make security an idol. Look with me in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. It says, talking of the false prophets and the false teachers of Israel, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, he says. This is exactly, this is exactly what the idol of security does. It, when, when we elevate our strength, the strength of others or the strength of this world to an ultimate status and we fulfill our longing for security in them, our heart lightly and gently whispers to us, peace, peace, you're secure, you're safe, you're at ease, you are all right, everything's okay, when in reality there is no peace. The idol of security pulls our hearts back to Egypt, and where, 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 we, where we think it's going to be safe and comfortable. But the irony, the irony in all of it is that there is no real peace. There's no real security that's found by going back to Egypt. All that remains in Egypt is slavery and oppression, where true joy is absent, and the hope that remains of something better to come is extinguished, is no more. When our need of security is fulfilled through things that we've talked about, and there's many other examples, material assets, human relationships, our own abilities, our physical appearance, etc., etc., or anything else, that this world has to offer, then we, like the Israelites, we settle. We settle for an Egypt where satisfaction is only temporary and emptiness becomes our destiny. The idol of security makes this world our home. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The idol of security it makes it impossible to truly trust in Jesus Christ and live with a passion for Him. So fulfilling our need for security, as we know, we've seen what the Bible says. Fulfilling this need for security by means of this world, is, it's like dwelling in a house of cards. It's like dwelling in a house that, that's made on the sand. It will eventually come crashing down. But the Bible says that changing the source of your security from this world to the true and solid anchor of Jesus Christ is what brings lasting and real, authentic security. I think that many people have the perception today that a relationship with Jesus requires you to abandon Abandon all feelings of security. If you want to follow Jesus, you're never going to feel secure. If you want to follow Jesus, you're going to have to take up your cross daily and follow him. And you are never going to feel at ease. You are never going to feel comfortable. Brothers and sisters, that's just not true. That's not what the Bible says. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 51 verse 12. 
I, God says, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, of the son of man who is made like grass? God says, who are you, who are you to find your source of security in anything other than me? Because I, God, am the one who provides for you and who gives you security and peace freely. It says in Joshua 23, 14, <clears throat> and now I am about to go the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word, not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All of them, all of them. All of the good things that God has promised to his people, the text says, has come to pass for you. Not one of them, not one of them has failed. God says, I'm more powerful. I am more powerful and trustworthy than any possible well of security that you could possibly place your confidence in. He says, I desire, I desire, God says to you, that you have security and your heart overflows with feelings of safety and peace. But those feelings of safety and peace, God says, must come from me because there remains no other avenue for you to experience true security. When God says to you, when he asks of you to say, here I am, send me, God's not asking you to live without feeling safe. God's not asking you to live without peace and tranquility, knowing that you are secure. Rather, when he asks you to say genuinely, here I am, Lord, send me, He's asking you to give up an inadequate and an insufficient source of security and to fully trust in His power and His promises, which are solid and which are sure. And when you allow His security to truly encompass, surround, and encircle your heart, you will have all the courage, all the fortitude that you need to say, here I am, send me. You'll have everything that you need when you place him as the source of your security to step into what is unfamiliar and unknown because you know, as the song goes, who holds your hand through all of it. It takes reorienting the source of our Security. Here are, a few, here are a few things of what doing so will do to our lives, um, fulfilling our need of security in Jesus and not in worldly sources. It will give us overpowering ammunition to fight the anxieties that flood our lives. There's been a lot of recent fear about uh, spikes in gas prices and grocery bills. All of us have seen that. All of us have personally experienced that. I just want to ask a question. Could that fear maybe, just maybe, maybe be telling us that we have an inadequate source of security sitting on the throne of our hearts? The Bible says that reorienting your source of security from this world to Jesus will give you all the ammunition you need to fight the anxieties that come flooding within your soul and that come pounding on the door of your heart. Re reorienting also the source of your security, and it, it enables us to abound with supernatural joy, even in the face of trials, even in the face of, of suffering, because I know that this world, it's not my home. I, I, I'm just here temporarily. My, 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 my peace, my security is in heaven. So whatever happens to me, whatever trials I go through, joy doesn't have to be absent from it. Supernatural joy that comes from the Spirit cannot uh, diminish or, or grow old or fade when Jesus is truly my source of security. That's what 
will happen to us when we truly fulfill our need of security in Jesus. And then lastly, it will empower us to authentically and genuinely say, Lord, here I am. Send me, wherever that may be, in uncharted waters, and what is uncomfortable, and what is familiar, and what is awkward, here I am, Lord, send me. You will be empowered to do so if Jesus sits on the throne of your heart, and he is the source of your security. We sing, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. A heart that really means that when they sing it is a heart that's secure in Jesus Christ. Make him, this morning, make him the source of your security and you will know what true confidence feels like. If you have any need this morning, if you are hurting in any way, we can pray for, pray for you or bear your burden. Or, or, or if you know that you're lost and you know that you need a relationship with Jesus, why don't you repent of your sins, come forward this morning, confess faith in him, and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and know the joy that the Lord brings. If you have any need this morning, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing. Oh, my God.